Okay, how's everyone's weekend? Fantastic, I hope. All right, so announcements. Overall, I'd say exam one looked pretty good. I think, uh, I mean, a few, I, I, yeah, I have a few hard problems on there, but I think it looked pretty good overall. I was pretty pleased with how you guys did. Uh, if anyone wants to, is upset with their grade or wants to argue <laughs> any over points, uh, you can come to my office hour uh, and I will discuss the exam with you. Uh, you have homework that's going to be due next Monday. Oh, uh, uh, most of exam one, I, I graded most everybody. There are a few that I still need to grade because they got emailed to me. So if it says you got a zero, nobody got a zero. So if it says you have a zero in the grade book, then uh, it's just because I haven't graded it quite yet. Homework due next Monday, and then office hours are back to normal this week. Do we have any questions about anything exam related, homework related, this week related, anything at all? <clears throat> uh, someone asks, is there an exam key? Yes, I'll be posting an exam key after I get all the exams graded. I think I have two or three more that got emailed to me uh, instead of going through, you know, some people had some technical issues, which is fine, uh, but I still need to grade those. After I grade those, I'll put the exam key up. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, cool beans. Time to start. So uh, today we're going to be talking about exponential functions. Okay, so uh, I have in the top the exponential function. Um, there are multiple exponential functions. There's one that we really like in calculus, and we'll see, we're going to see why today. There's one that is our favorite. Um, but the, there are infinitely many exponential functions. Uh, so far, we've differentiated all kinds of functions, mostly polynomials uh, and then compositions of polynomials with square roots and uh, some trig functions. Uh, there's one function. Uh, that we haven't differentiated yet. Uh, well, I mean, there's multiple functions we haven't differentiated yet. But one very special one, that's the exponential function, okay? So these are functions that look like f of x is two to the x, or g of x is one third to the x, or h of x is e to the x, okay? So instead of having x to some power, you're used to seeing stuff like f of x equals x squared, differentiating that to get two x. If you try to use the power rule, I guarantee, I guarantee you someone, I'm gonna ask you to take a derivative of f of x is to the x and someone's gonna try to use the power rule. You can't use the power rule for this, okay? Because this isn't a power of x. This is, x is in the exponent now, not the base, okay? So <clears throat> these are fundamentally different from anything we've, we've worked with so far. Uh, these functions come up a lot in the natural sciences. Anytime you're, uh, you have uh, population growth or population uh, or an infectious disease, for instance, that normally follows an exponential curve, uh, the, the number of cases that you're looking at. Uh, exponential decay comes up when you're looking at uh, carbon dating, when you're looking at how old some, some very old uh, object is. We use carbon dating, which relies on the exponential function. Okay, so this comes up all the time. Uh, Newton's law of cooling, when you talk, when you put a hot cup of coffee in a cool room, this exponential function describes how that cools off in, in that room. Okay, so it's incredibly useful. We're going to use it. So get used to it. Okay. Sorry, that was too rough. Uh, so before we try and differentiate these, though, we're going to need to recall a few basic facts about them. Okay. So first of all, notice that all these 2 to the x, 1 third to the x, e to the x, e is 2.71828, and it keeps going. It's not just that. But all these are positive numbers, and that's not by accident. When we're talking about an exponential function, the base, the number, <clears throat> in the base has to be 
a positive number, okay? So here's a, a graph of a couple of exponential functions. The blue curve there is two to the x, y equals two to the x. So notice that unlike y equals x squared, which goes, you know, something like that. I mean, it goes through zero, zero, but a parabola, this instead of, oops, this instead, as we go from right to left, right on time. Instead, as we go from right to left, notice that as we go towards negative numbers, this function keeps decaying, right? It keeps getting smaller and smaller. So as x goes, uh, it gets more and more negative. These functions don't pop back up like parabolas do. So that's for y equals to the x and y equals three to the x look very similar, right? I'm going to erase this. They look pretty similar. Y equals three to the x obviously just grows a little faster. If I take three squared, that's bigger than two squared, right? Uh, y equals one half to the x <clears throat> is just y equals to the x and I've flipped it across the y axis, okay? So if your base is between zero and one, then the exponential curve is going to look roughly like this thing. It's going to start big for x negative, and then as x gets positive, then the function is going to die off. That's called exponential decay. If your base is between, <clears throat> or if your base is positive and bigger than one, then it's going to look like one of these two over here. It's going to start small for x negative and then get exponentially large is why we call them exponential functions. Okay. So that's what these graphs look like. Okay. So <clears throat> some basic facts that we need to know about exponential functions. We're assuming A, which A is, again, this is the number in the base. I have a base and I have an exponent. A is the number in the base. If A is positive, A is greater than zero, <clears throat> And R and S, these are any old real numbers. They could be negative 23.4. They could be 105. They can be pi. Any old real number, okay? Then we have the following. First of all, A to the zero, what is that? Who remembers? I heard it, I think. One, exactly. A to the zero is one. It is not zero, okay? A to the zero is one. <clears throat> A to the R, R is uh, any real number. A to the R is always bigger than zero. All right. So <clears throat> this is going to be important in the future. Excellent question. Yeah, someone asks what happens if the base is negative. We can't really have that because if we if I take a negative number to the one half because x can be anything, right? If I take a negative number to the one half, then I'm getting complex numbers. We don't have the tool to deal with imaginary numbers yet, okay? So a has to be bigger than zero for, for all of these. <clears throat> okay, moving on. Um, oh, I wanted to mention this. If you're ever confronted with an equation that looks like a to the x equals zero, this has no solution. Okay, there is no x that would make this true. This is gonna come up later when we talk about optimizing functions, okay? So you don't need to know what that word means quite yet, but later you're gonna be faced with, with equations like this. These have no solutions, okay? All right, uh, third line, a to the r times a to the s. What is this equal to with just one a? What is this equal to? Yes, a to the r plus s, perfect. Perfect. Any questions on that? a to the r divided by a to the s, what is this equal to? a to the, what was it? Yes, a, yeah, perfect, a to the r minus s. And the way you can get that, you can get this from the previous line, well, this is just a to the r times a to the minus s, right? 
we rewrite reciprocals all the time like that now to use the uh, power rule. Same idea, but we're not using power rule on these. Okay, and lastly, a to the r, all to the s. What is that? Yes, perfect. A to the r times s. Perfect. Uh, someone asked, why don't we use x as a symbol? Uh, you can if you want. I'm just the r and s. I just needed two symbols. I didn't want to use x and y. I used r and s. Okay. All right. Are there any questions about any of these uh, properties of exponential functions? All right, and then we're going to dive right into an example. And this specific example is going to be important in a second because this looks like almost, it looks like a, a definition of a derivative problem, right? So I want to simplify 7 to the x plus h minus 7x. And by simplify, uh, simplify is kind of a vague. Thing. So I'm just going to, we're just going to dive in and start messing with this until we get to where I want you to, to get with it. Okay. So what, what could I do with this to make this look different? There's really one thing you can do here. 7 to the x plus h, how can I rewrite that? Perfect. 7 to the x times 7 to the h. And then I didn't mess with this at all. Minus 7 to the x. Good. All right. And then, yeah, exactly. And then someone says we want to factor this. That's exactly right. I've got 7 to the x in both of these terms. So I can factor that 7 to the x out. <clears throat> so then this is equal to 7 to the x times, well, when I factor 7 to the x out here, I'm just going to be left with 7 to the h. What happens when I factor out 7 to the x here? Minus 1. Exactly. So this is as far as we're going to go. And it's because we're about to look at the definition of the derivative. And I wanted you guys to see factoring that top before I just did it with a random, with a, with a arbitrary base. Okay. So are there any questions about why this is equal to that? All right, <clears throat> then it's time to look at the derivative. Okay, so now instead of seven, we're going to be working with an arbitrary positive base A. Okay, where A again is some <clears throat> positive real number. We want to compute the derivative, if it exists, uh, f prime of x. f prime of x is A to the x. Okay, so this is going to be equal to then f prime of x is equal to, <clears throat> well, f uh, of x plus h. What is this? This was something on the exam, by the way, I saw that was that we might need a little work on. So what, what do I get when I plug x plus h in for, for x into f of x? Perfect. I get a to the x plus h. H. Yeah, all this notation means is everywhere you see an x, you replace that with x plus h. Okay, this is not a to the x and then plus h down here, which I saw a lot of that on the exam. So make sure you're plugging in only to the x. Okay. Very good. All right, and then minus f of x, well, that's just, I mean, that's just written right there. So that's minus a, the x, and then I'm dividing by h, and then I need to take the limit as h goes to zero, right? <clears throat> yes, very good. So now this is equal to the limit as h goes to zero. I know it's annoying to write that over and over. Uh, but it's good practice too, just so you know. Uh, so what is the top equal to? Well, what is that first term equal to? Perfect. 
perfect. A to the X times A to the H. Perfect. And then I haven't changed anything else. I'll leave that like that. I can't. Okay, then what do we do? You can factor out a to the x. Perfect. I've got an a to the x in both of those terms in the numerator, right? So this is a to the x times a to the h minus a to the 0, right? I factored out a to the x, but a to the 0 is just 1. And then all divided by h. And now here's kind of a key thing to see. Does this a to the x... Does that depend on H at all now? No. And so I can just pull that out of the limit. As far as the limit is concerned, the limit as H goes to zero, A to the X is a constant with respect to H. Okay, so you can just pull that out in front of the limit. So this is equal to A to the X times the limit as H approaches zero of A to the H minus one all divided by H. Okay, so notice before we move on, we're taking the derivative of a to the x, and I'm going to end up with a to the x times something. So that's pretty interesting. What is this thing here that I'm, that I'm getting? I'm going to write it out over here one more time. The limit as h approaches 0 of a to the h minus 1 divided by h. Who can tell me what that is? It's not just, well, if anyone can actually tell me what it is, I I'm going to kick you into calc two right away, if you know it right away. Hmm? Change the one. Yeah, I could write it. I could write it. That might be helpful. Yeah. So let's write it as this is the limit as, oh gosh writing the limit as h approaches zero of a to the h minus a to the zero divided by h i'll write h minus zero right so written that way maybe maybe that confused you more maybe it helps you see what this is this is if we remember the alternate form, well, a to the h, let me write this as this is the limit as h goes to zero, a to the h, that's just f of h, right? f of x was a to the x, so a to the h is just f of h. a to the zero, well, that's just minus f of zero divided by h minus zero. And now looking at it like this, and remembering that alternate form of the derivative, uh, we have this is actually f prime of zero, right? This relies on that alternate form of, of the derivative. <clears throat> so, this tells me then that f prime of x, where f of x is a to the x, is equal to a to the x times f prime of zero, which doesn't seem very helpful because now to find the derivative, I need to know the derivative at, at zero, right? So, <clears throat> I mean, this is the derivative. This is technically the derivative. So this f prime of zero, though, is annoying. And the way we're going to get rid of it is we're going to choose a very carefully. Okay? So if you play around, <clears throat> oh, let me fill this in. So this is what we just found. If we play around with a, if we choose a just right, then we can make this f prime of zero equal to one. Okay, and who can guess what a needs to be 
So that f prime of zero is equal to one. I'll give you a hint. Uh, if a is two, then f prime of zero is less than one. And if a is three, f prime of zero is greater than one. Ah, yeah, it's E. E is the, it's why it's called the natural base is because it makes this f prime of zero that shows up in that derivative, it makes it one and we don't have to worry about it. This is why E shows up all the time because it makes this derivative so nice, okay? So when A is equal to E, which is about 2.7, and it keeps going. I don't have that memorized. I just pulled that from the calculator. But when, uh, when we choose the base to be E, then f prime of zero is one. And this is, you can actually take this to be the definition of the number E. And if you do that, you, you can calculate E with a calculator just by plugging in smaller and smaller values for H. Okay. So <clears throat> all this uh, is to say, uh, all, we, we've shown that f prime of X, if, if f of X is E to the X, then that means that f prime of zero is one, right? And so up here, we're only left with the e to the x here, okay? So if f of x is e, the natural base to the x, then f prime of x is also e to the x. This is what, this is another feature of e to the x that we love so much is that it, it is its own derivative, which later when you take some higher level math classes, that will be very, very important uh, for taking guesses at certain equations, the solution to certain equations. Well, are there any questions about why this is true? Okay, so examples, find the equation of the tangent line to the graph of the function f of x equals e to the negative x squared at x equals one. Okay, so I'm finding the equation of a line, right? So what two things do I need? I need a slope, very good. I need a slope, what else do I need? And I need a point on the line. Very good. So first, uh, what's the point on the line going to be? Or at least what's the X coordinate going to be? Yeah, the X coordinate is going to be one. And then how would I get the Y coordinate? Yeah, I plug it into F of X, right? I plug X equals one into F of X and I get E to the negative one. Questions there about why this is the point on the line. Okay, and then slope. The slope of the tangent line. What is that? Yeah, it's always the derivative. Whenever I say slope, if you just shout derivative at me, you'll probably you'll definitely be right. Okay, so the derivative and where in particular, because it's not just f prime of x. The slope is one number, right? So f prime of at one, exactly. I need f prime of one. Okay. So, but to find f prime of one, now that we know the chain rule and the rule for differentiating exponential functions, we can just <clears throat> uh, find f prime of x and then plug in one. Okay, so I want f prime of x. Well, this is a composition of functions, right? So what's the first thing that I do to X? Or in other words, what's the inside function? Yeah, I, I, I take X and I square it and I take, then I take its negative, right? Okay, so that's the inside function. And what is the outside function?
It's a little weird now. Yeah, I'm not multiplying by e. I'm taking whatever I have. I'm taking e to that, right? My outside function is just e to the x. Does everybody see that? Because when I plug this in here, I end up with that. Okay? So then the chain rule, I'm going to need some derivatives here. So the derivative of the outside, well, what's the derivative of e to the x? Just e to the x, exactly. And then what's the derivative of, of uh, negative x squared? Negative 2x, perfect. So f prime of x, I want the derivative of the outside at the inside. So it's going to be e to the negative x squared. And then times what? Yeah, times negative 2x, times the derivative of the inside, right? Derivative of the outside at the inside times derivative of the inside. Cool. So then, that's f prime of x. I want f prime of 1. Well, let's plug in, uh, plug in 1 for x. And it's going to look, it's going to have an e in it, but that's okay. So I'm going to get negative 2 times e to the minus 1. And that's a perfectly acceptable slope. It's just a number. It has e, but that's fine. So then, writing the equation of the line in point-slope form, I'm going to have y minus what? e to the negative 1. Perfect. This is equal to my slope. This is negative 2 times e to the minus 1 times what? Perfect. And you're done. <clears throat> Any questions about this? Can you go over the derivative part again? Yeah, absolutely. So the derivative, so we have to use the chain rule here, right? If this was just e to the x, then we could just say the derivative is e to the x. But we have, we have a, a composition of functions where the inside function is negative x squared. The outside function is e to the x. Is that clear so far? Why the yeah. OK. So then the chain rule just says, well, to take the derivative of a composition of functions, f of g of x, you take the derivative of the outside function and you evaluate it at the inside. So the derivative of the outside, this e to the x is technically different than this e to the x because this e to the x is technically the derivative. I mean, e to the x and e to the x are obviously the same. But I, I take the derivative of the outside function, the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x, okay? And then I plug in the inside function into that. So that's the first part of the chain rule. Is that OK? Yeah. OK. And then the, the rest of the chain rule says, then you just multiply by what, multiply what you got from that. You multiply that by the derivative of the inside. And the derivative of the inside, this right here, x squared, remember, x squared is not an exponential function. This is a power function. x is the base. And so we just use the power rule for the derivative of the inside. Okay, so that's why this is negative 2x. Okay. So you only multiply by the inside. You, you multiply by the derivative of the inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I think we had another question. Is the outside derivative e to the x considered a constant? even with the presence of x. No, e to the x is not considered a, a, a constant. Uh, that's why we had to consider it the outside function and take its derivative. Are there any other questions on this one? Okay. So, <clears throat> 
Uh, we're going to talk really quick about logarithms. We're going to, I think by the end of the day, I'm going to show you the derivative of every exponential function in the world. But to do that, we need to talk for one second about uh, logarithms. Oh, I got one. I got a question. Why is the derivative of e to the x the same as e to the x? That's because when we went through this, uh, uh, when we went through the definition of the derivative, we ended up with this. And e is just the number that we pick so that f prime of zero is one. You can take it to be the definition of the number e. Okay. And so that's why the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. And I'm going to show you in a minute that the derivative of like 2 to the x is not as nice. It's still pretty nice, but there's this f prime of 0. You have to worry about that factor. So, but in order to talk about that, uh, that factor, we need to talk for one second about logarithms. So has everyone seen logarithms before? If not, that's OK. Hopefully, yes. There's really just, for right now, there's really just one uh, feature of logarithms that I care about. So logarithms undo the exponential function. Uh, so in other words, <clears throat> the, the natural logarithm is the special function that satisfies this set of equations, that the natural log of e to the x uh, is equal to x. And the natural log, or sorry, e to the natural log of x is equal to x. So in other words, they're inverse functions. If you remember, I talked about that, I think, the second day, uh, an inverse function. These are inverses of each other, natural log of x and e to the x. Okay. And the main feature that I care about for these <clears throat> is the, the following. Oh, right, sorry. Uh, we're going to find out what the, the, the natural log of the x is itself a function, and we're going to find out what that derivative is tomorrow. Today, we're just going to use the feature that if I take, if a is any number, a does not have to be e here, if a is any number, then the main property that I care about today is that the natural log of a to the x, where a is positive, is equal to x times the natural log of a. You can bring this exponent out in front. This is not the power rule. I did not differentiate anything. Some people see this and they think power rule. This is not the power rule. This is just a rule that you can use to simplify logarithms. Okay. So this is going to be very important for us in finding the derivative of <clears throat> just a general exponential function. Gotcha. So let me rewrite this here. Log of a. So the way we're going to use this fact is we're going to differentiate, we're going to be able to differentiate all other exponential functions by sort of rewriting them using this. We're going to rewrite them so that instead of a to the x, it's going to be e to something that's close to x. Okay? And then we're going to use the chain rule. So let's illustrate with an example. We're going to find the derivative of f of x equals 3 to the x. First of all, we know that it has to look like, when we, when we did the definition of the derivative, we know that it has to look like f prime of x is equal to 3 to the x times f prime of 0. It has to look like this. This is what we got when we ran through the definition of the derivative. And so really, all we need to do is we need to find out what is that f prime of 0. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to use the chain rule to, re or not the chain rule, we're going to use uh, the rules for logarithms to rewrite this, okay? So first of all, if this was the natural log of 3 to the x, it's not, but let's pretend it is for a second, then what would this equal? x times the natural log of 3, right? And now here comes the magic trick. How can I get from this back to this? I can use the fact that e 
and natural e to the x and natural log of x undo each other. Okay, so if I raise both sides of this equation, if I just put an e in the bottom like this, well, on the left I have e to the natural log of three to the x. So these undo each other. I'm just left with three to the x on the left. Is everybody okay with that? And then on the right, well, this x is in the way. Now nothing, now there's no undoing of anything, but that's okay because I know how to differentiate e to anything with the chain rule, okay? So I get three to the x is equal to e to the x times natural log of three, okay? And we're going to use this fact that these two things are equal to each other. I'm going to just differentiate this because I know how to differentiate that with the chain rule to find the derivative of three to the X. Okay. So <clears throat> this is a chain rule problem. What is the inside function and what is the outside function? Something to keep in mind also, natural log of three, this is just a number. Natural log of three is a little bit bigger than one, okay? Perfect, the inside is X times the natural log of three. Perfect. What's the outside function? E to the X, perfect. E to the X, I don't know why I wrote this the opposite of how I normally do, but for consistency, I'm going to try to use my surgeon-like focus. There we go. All right. <clears throat> so then, chain rule. I need the derivative of the outside function. So what's the derivative of the outside function? Just e to the x. Perfect. Okay. What's the derivative of the inside function? Again, remember, natural log of three is just a constant. So this is x to the first times natural log of three. One. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, so when I differentiate the x to the first, well, that's just power rule. I'll get one times x to the zero. That's just one. And then this natural log of three comes along for the ride. It's a constant. Okay, so I'm going to get natural log of three. So the chain rule says f prime of x. <clears throat> well, I need the derivative of the outside. That's right here. So e to the, and then at, evaluated at the inside. So e to the x times the natural log of three and then times the derivative of the inside, natural log of three. Okay. And then we're almost done. Technically, you could be done if you wanted, but what is that? What is that that I just circled? Perfect. That we, that's what we started with, right? That was, that's three to the x. So this is three to the x times the natural log of three. Okay. So that makes sense. And does everybody see that three, I mean, there's no, zero things special about three. I could have had any number and this trick of writing just first the natural log of a to the x instead of just three to the x. The, this trick still works. It doesn't matter that it was a three, it could have been a 5,029.4, and this still would have worked exactly the same way, okay? So in general, did I write it down? Yes, in general, we're going to have f prime of x if f of x is a to the x. Now a is just any old positive number. Well, I'm gonna prove it, but you do the exact same thing we just did with three, only now with a. And you're going to end up with f prime of x is a to the x times, which we already knew that had to be there from the definition of the derivative, a to the x times 
Now it's just natural log of A. I'm going to prove this in one. All right, so here we go. So the proof of this, again, f of x is equal to a to the x. Well, the exact same trick we did. If I write natural log of a to the x, well, what is that? How can I rewrite that? Perfect, x times the natural log of a. And then to get back to here, well, I'm just going to put an e under both of those, right? And now the e and the natural log cancel each other out. I'm left with a to the x equals, and then I can't really do any cancellation over here. But again, that's a, I want something in the form e to the something. So a to the x equals e to the x times the natural log of a. <clears throat> so then when I take f prime of x, well, I'm really taking the derivative with respect to x of e to the x natural log of a. So I need, again, I need to look at what's my outside function and what's my inside function, because this is a chain rule problem. So what's my outside function here? Or let's do inside function first. What's my inside function? x times natural log of a, perfect. And then what's my outside function? e to the x, perfect. So then the derivative of the outside, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, perfect. And then the derivative of uh, x times the natural log of a, yeah, just natural log of a, perfect. So then the chain rule says, the deri this derivative, uh, well, I'm gonna get the derivative of the outside evaluated at the inside. I'm gonna get e to the x natural log of a. And then that's times the derivative of the inside times the natural log of a. And last but not least, we just rewrite that. Okay. That could look a little less. There we go. So then this is just a to the x times natural log of a. Do we have any questions on that? No, not at all, not at all. Exactly, just from, from here on in, if you, if you have this memorized, that's great. If you if you want to go through this work every time, it's going to take you a little bit longer, but um, it would make me happy to know that you guys can work this out from scratch. Like that would be great. But no, if you if you want to just memorize the derivative of a to the x is a to the x times natural log of a, that's perfectly fine with me. No, no, yeah. Someone asked, do, do we need to memorize the proof for the exam? Not at all. No, this next exam is going to be much more um, applications of derivatives. How exactly do you get a to the x? Uh, here? Right there? No, at the end, here the a to the x times the natural log of a. Oh, there? Yeah, yeah. So the, this, uh, that came from this starting fact um, where, where we did that. Yeah. Little trick that ended up saving our lives. Right. Yeah. Any other questions? It's really quite a weird, a strange circle that like we start with a derivative and then we have to get f prime of zero. So we just pick a number so that we get one and then we get all the exponential derivatives. It's crazy. It's really pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. That's math. Be math majors. Fun like this happens all the time in math. Okay. All right, so to finish off class, let's look at uh, the following uh, derivatives. So first, we're going to take the derivative of uh, 2 to the minus x times x to the 2. 
Okay, so let's just look at that first before we move on. So one, f prime of x. Well, I'm taking two to the minus x times x to the two. So what rules am I going to use here to differentiate this? Yeah, I need the product rule, right? Two to the minus x times x to the two. So the product rule says if I highlight using my special SU blue and SU red, my uh, blue function will be the first one. So I take the derivative of the blue function and I leave the red function alone, right? So within this product rule, technically I need the chain rule, right? Because I need uh, two to the minus x. This is a composition, right? Of two to the x with negative x. I could rewrite it. Who could tell me how I could rewrite it so I wouldn't need the chain rule? Two over one to the x. Oh, so close. Yeah, 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 one over two to the x, right? Yeah, two to the minus x is one over two to the x. And this is just the same thing as one half all to the x, right? Because one to the x, that's just one. So now you can use, we don't need the chain rule at all. One half, well, that's just a positive number. This is just a positive number to the x. We know how to differentiate that now, right? So what's the derivative of one half to the x? So here a is one half. Perfect, one half to the x, and then times natural log of one half, perfect. And then, so there's the derivative of the first part. I leave the second part alone, times x squared. Plus, now I will leave the SU blue alone, oh, one half to the x times, <clears throat> now I need the derivative of x squared. What was the derivative of x squared? Yeah, just 2x, right? Don't confuse, don't mix up the power rule with this new exponential derivative, okay? I know it's, I know it's gonna happen, it's inevitable, but, they're different things. When the x is in the base and you're taking the derivative, you need the power rule. When the x is in the exponent, then you need this exponential derivative. Okay. So <clears throat> this, if you want, you can you can simplify this as much as you want, but you can also just leave this as as it is. I like to, I typically like to, when I have natural logs, I typically like to write my x is out in front just to be just so that I don't accidentally put the x's inside the natural log. But that's mostly a me thing. Okay. okay. Any questions on this? Okay. I will fill out the rest of these. Uh, after class, before I upload these notes to Canvas. There's one thing I wanted to bring everybody's attention to. Stop share, new share. <clears throat> uh, yeah, sure, desktop. Yeah. Uh, if you go in, in the readings and lectures, uh, I put a link to section 3.9 in a free online textbook that has uh, stuff about what we talked about today exponential and it's also going to have stuff on logarithmic functions so the derivatives of those if you want to read a little more your book puts exponential and logarithmic functions in a weird section way later in the book you have a quite was that a question yeah. oh okay <laughs> uh yeah your book puts it way late i like the book overall but it, it it does exponential functions way too late in my opinion it's the only thing wrong with it so uh this uh chapter of this book is really the section of this book it is a pretty good explanation of exponential and logarithmic functions and derivatives. So tomorrow we're going to talk about logarithmic functions a little more and their derivatives. Okay. Okay. So if we don't have any questions, 
if people who are here, please wipe down your desk before you go. Everybody online, if anybody has questions, you can stick around and ask. But other than that, everybody feel free to have a